with that, I think we're ready, John, for you to present. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Good morning, everyone. My name is John Formby, and today I'm going to be talking to you about common tree pests in New Mexico. I'm going to fo focus on urban species, but just be aware these do happen in the wild and urban interface uh, out in the, the national forest, the forest and woodlands of New Mexico. Um, so what is a pest? Um, it's subjective. Uh, a pest can be a pest to one person, maybe not a pest to another person. Uh, but today I'm going to be talking about tree pests that cause harm or cause damage in some way, whether it's mortality uh, from bark beetles or defoliation from caterpillars. Um, <clears throat> and some of these are going to be primary pests. And primary pests are those that cause direct mortality, such as bark beetles. And others are going to be those that maybe defoliate the tree, cause some aesthetic loss, uh, loss of the value of that tree, or just minor damage. And uh, this is a Douglas fir tussock moth. So some current pests that we have to be aware of here in New Mexico in the urban environment. Penny needle scale, a big one, okay? Um, generally what we see, and I describe it as uh, chia seeds kind of stuck to the older needles. So it's an armored scale. Contact insecticides do nothing at this stage when they're on the needles. And about this time, of years when we really start seeing those chlorotic or those dying needles. The insects been feeding in that armored scale over the winter, sucking the plant juices from those needles and they turn brown. And about this time of year, over the next month or two, is when I was with New Mexico State Forestry, I got a lot of calls about this. Um, AKA thinia, thinia needle scale, because it does really cause thinning to the canopy. It's a chronic issue, stays in the same place year after year. Um, so, as you can see, you can see through this canopy that's been defoliated year after year. Chronic major issue in and around Santa Fe, really, it's, there's the areas that it's in, it's, it's um, very severe, it's there, 10 years, 20 years, it's been there. Um, also a problem in the East Mountains, Albuquerque and Las Cruces. Can stress the trees, so on top of drought, drought stress that we have, it can stress the trees even more, leading to problems. Rarely leads to direct mortality. Generally, we see this thinning of the canopy, um, but it can stress the trees out on top of drought to where they do get uh, secondarily attacked by bark beetles, attacked and killed. Control strategies, carbaryl, contact insecticide, horticulture oils, or neem oil. There's a short treatment window, window with this. Um, you gotta really be out there looking for the crawlers. That's when you apply this, is when, when they are in the crawler stage and the females are uh, reproducing, producing their offspring, and they're on the tree. You gotta be in the field to recognize when this time is. It can vary a little bit, depending on temperatures. Um, imidacloprid, the uh, neonicotinoid, it's a systemic. So timing's not an issue. You get it into the tree, whether it's direct injection, a soil drench, that type of thing. You don't really have to worry about timing with this. Um, and there's also less off-target off effects. So you're not putting the insecticide out into the environment, you're not spraying it, you're just you know, trying to directly put it into the tree. Remove egg masses, this is another treatment um, strategy. Uh, doesn't work very well. I've worked with several homeowners associations in Santa Fe that tried only water. They tried to spray the egg masses off the tree, tried to collect those egg masses, uh, both HOAs, it, it, was, it did not work for them. Um, it says doesn't always work. I'd say it probably doesn't work at all. Or you can try to remove it by hand. So those are some options. And do not use fertilizers with high nitrogen. Um, if people want to fertilize their tree, I usually recommend yum yum mix, but just something that's low and slow. The reason you don't want to use high uh, fertilizers with high nitrogen is because these sap sucking insects, such as um, this armored scale, they, they love, uh, it increases their fitness, they have more offspring, so it can re really lead to, to more problems. And this is a picture of the egg masses here. 
Um, and you can see that it's just, it takes a long time to get those egg masses off. If they're higher in the tree, it's difficult to get them off. So really, you know, it's, it's just something that doesn't work very well, just trying to remove those egg masses. Cooley spruce gall adelgid. This is something that probably everyone's seen. Maybe everyone doesn't know exactly what it is. It kind of looks like a cone. Um, but it needs two hosts to complete development. And this one is a, a secondary pest. Just really causes some aesthetic loss. Um, so it, it, uses spruce, it uses spruce and dug fir to complete its development. The galls resemble cones, as you can see here. It rarely causes harm to the tree. It's just in, in there kind of doing it, its thing, um, not really harming the tree. But in extremely heavy infestations, it may cause stunted growth, um, slow to stunted, to stunted growth. Um, and here is, it's very conspicuous on spruce, but here's an image of it in its stage where it's on Douglas fir. So a little bit different to, to recognize, to see. But as you can tell, it's, it's caused some, some death of this tip. Control, control strategies, again, carbaryl, the contact insecticide, permethrin is another one. These are applied foliar to the needles and apply in spring. Insecticidal soaps can work on this phase on Doug fir here, and you want to focus on the terminals. And imidacloprid, something that can get into the, the tree itself, again, less off-target effects. Um, getting into the tree, as those feed on the tree, they die. We do have problems with uptake of systemic insecticides in the southwest because of drought. Trees need to be well watered to have a good uptake of these um, systemic insecticides. So, so just keep that in, in your mind that um, we do have issues with systemic in insecticide uptake during drought periods. Pinion nips. I'm going to be talking about bark beetles uh, later in the afternoon, go more in depth in them. Just kind of mention two here um, right off the bat, the biggest one, pinion ips. For those of you who are here in the 2000, early 2000s, tens of millions of pinion trees were killed due to drought and then attacked by bark beetle. Um, commonly attack stressed or injured trees, some activity in the East Mountains around Edgewood. There's a huge outbreak right now. Um, and wildland urban areas. Santa Fe is seeing some activity. I've seen some in Daddle. Um, so just kind of those wildland urban areas. Not much activity within the cities, um, just cause the populations aren't, the be beetle populations aren't as high as they are in the wildland urban interface. Directly leads to mortality. So again, a primary pest. When the insect gets in there, um, when the tree's being mass attacked by these beetles, within one to three days, hundreds if not thousands of beetles can attack these trees, okay? So they mass attack trees. Once they're in the tree, there's nothing you can do, okay? Uh, best is to, uh, and I'll get it down here in prevention strategies, but it's really more of a treatment strategy than prevention at that point. But prevention is, is key. Firewood can contain beetles, so if you're taking downed uh, infested material, you know, don't take it back to your house, put it next to another pinion tree, that's just asking for trouble on your own property. You won't always see pitch tubes. Uh, right now, over the last couple of years, I've looked at a lot of pinion trees that have been infested by bark beetles, and there's only boring dust. There are no pitch tubes like you see here in that inset image. Um, you know, pitch tubes are, are pretty big. Um, they're a little gummy. Pinion is resinous itself. It kind of has some hardened sap on there, so you got to really know what you're looking for, how to distinguish a pitch tube from just the pitch of the tree. Um, but a telltale sign is when the beetle is winning, the pitch tube is going to be brown in color, kind of a bronze color. You see that one pitch tube there, it's kind of white. That means that the tree's probably suffocated or pitched out that beetle, and the tree's won, and now it's sealing up that wound. But those other two there that are a little bit more brown, the beetle's won in that instance. Uh, but again, you won't always see pitch tubes. You'll just see boring dust accumulated in the bark fissures or at the base of the tree or at crotches of the tree. Um, prevention strategies. You want to water properly in times of drought. Now, people that have you know, 10 or 20 trees, not feasible, but you want to really target those high-value trees that offer shade, protection, screen from the neighbors, screen from the road. Um, so that's what you want to focus on. 
Fertilize high value trees. Um, again, some low and slow. You don't want too high nitrogen, especially for a pine tree, a pinion tree. Um, Carbol and per permethrin sprayed about this time of year on the trunk. It will set up that protect, pr to protect those trees during the summer from attack. So if you have a high population of, of beetles around the area, you might want to consider treating this way. It's, it's the best way to treat a tree uh, for prevention is, is with um, insecticide. Not a lot of people like to use it, but it is the best way. Fell and remove. If you do have infested trees, you want to fell and remove. You want to get that off the property, take it to a green waste facility, um, just so it's not spreading to your property or to your neighbor's properties, or if you have clients, it's not spreading around their property or their neighbor's properties. Verbenone. Some people do recommend verbenone right now for um, for prevention of pinion nips. Um, verbenone is an anti-aggregation pheromone for mountain pine beetle, for a dendroctinus species, not a nip species. Um, currently, we are, there are being research studies being done to see if verbenone does work for ips, but right now the literature, the data is just not there to say it does. Um, but if it is, um, it may be a game changer. One thing uh, they've tried is verbenone plus a off-host a uh, volatile chemical like putting verbenone, there are these little packets, little chemical packets you staple to the tree. Anti-aggregation pheromones, it says this tree uh, no longer can take any beetles, no vacancy basically, and uh, the, the beetles will go find somewhere else. So, um, so that's what an anti-aggregation pheromone is. And it only works with dendroctinus right now, specifically mountain pine beetle. And I'll talk about a different anti-aggregation pheromone, MCH, for Douglas fir and spruce um, later this afternoon. Pine engraver, Ips pinei. Before I want to get into this, I did see there is a question about can pinion Ips bark beetles attack ponderosa, and can ponderosa, those that attack ponderosa pine, attack pinion? It's very, very rare. I've seen it. I've heard reports of it, seen it in the literature, but it's very rare that a pinion ips bark beetle attacks a ponderosa and that those species, like this ips pinei, attacks pinion. But it, it can happen, but it's, it's rare. Commonly attacks, again, these ips species commonly attack stress and injured trees. That's what they focus on. So those stressed by drought, wind injured, injured trees, those types of things. Wild and urban interface, um, areas usually pockets of mortality, as you'll see. Um, again, primary pest directly leads to mortality. Prevention is key. Basically, this is the same slide as the pinion nip slide. Um, you know, no, no treatments available once it's mass attacked. Um, again, this is all kind of the same, same as that slide before. And again, verbenone at this moment, um, I don't recommend using verbenone. If, if you have clients that are willing to spend the money, um, you know, Make sure you read the literature. Make sure you're putting the proper amount of verbenone out there um, and uh, just doing it you know, correctly. And, and it, you know, it, could, it could work, but we just don't have that data saying it does yet in the literature. Honey locust borer. This is a big one in the urban environment, commonly in the urban environment. Attacks small and large trees. Uh, also stems greater than two inches, so it will attack branches greater than two inches. I've even seen it at my house. I have a huge honey locust. The roots were damaged before I moved in the house, and they actually attacked the roots that are showing there at the ground. So it can attack roots too. Usually attacks stressed trees, and why are they stressed? Well, because they've been put into the middle of a parking lot with very little root zone, right? So um, also you have that radiant heat coming off the parking lot, so these trees are just stressed. Um, with restricted root zones. Also, sun scalded, air, injured and sun scalded trees. This tree right here was sun scalded. It was in the middle of a parking lot, getting that you know, winter uh, direct sunlight. Rarely leads to tree mortality, but it can hasten decline and cause branch flagging. And they have these characteristic D shaped exit holes. Well, does an EAB have a characteristic D shaped exit hole? Yes, it does. These are cousins, okay? Um, um, but definitely not, you know, not, not as bad as a pest as emerald ash borer. And you know, D-shaped exit hole in a honey locust, it's going to be a honey locust borer in an ash, emerald ash borer. Prevention strategies, again, I'll harp on this a lot. Water trees, those high value tree, trees in times of drought. 
plan in sight that minimize stress, um, try to you know, not plant them anywhere that's restricting the root zone, prevent mechanical injury or, or environmental injury. And carbaryl can also be applied to the trunk to protect uh, the tree. So apply it about this time of year. Sap suckers, this is a big one that I had a lot of calls on, um, especially in the East Mountains for some reason. Occasionally, uh, uh, like I said, in urban areas, I saw it a lot in the East Mountains, feeds on sap and insects, okay? Um, holes in horizontal lines, sometimes vertical lines like this. Um, causes branch flagging, sometimes tree mortality by girdling. So if that, that sap sucker's feeding all the way around the tree, it may girdle the whole tree, and you know, after a couple of years, the whole tree might die. Um, control strategies, wrap and burlap. Wrap the injury in burlap. This is the best thing I've found um, dealing with landowners or homeowners. Wrap with bur uh, burlap. Very low cost, very easy to do. So uh, there's this bird deterrent gel, kind of like Vaseline. It's more expensive, so you know, burlap or any kind of type of um, uh, fabric that's going to be a little bit more um, porous, you know, let a lot, little bit more air in. Hang suet feeders near attacked trees. I had some homeowners do that. I'm um, not so sure that it worked, but the burlap definitely works. Pitch moth, big one, especially in pinion trees. Most severe damage is to urban trees greater than 20 feet. Um, there's these large oozing masses, okay? They're very gummy if you push on them. Very, very gummy. There's a caterpillar in there. So this female moth here, she lays her eggs on the bark. That egg hatches, and a little caterpillar bores in the tree, starts feeding, and the tree responds by having this oozy pitch. It, the moth is feeding on that pitch. Um, attacks pinion and ponderosa. I rarely see it on ponderosa. It's primarily urban or wild and urban interface pinion trees. Um, repeated attacks can weak, weaken the tree, kill branches. I've seen very heavily infested trees that have a lot of dieback going on. Control strategies, avoid pruning or mechanical injury during summer. This is good to do anyway with pinion or ponderosa. You don't want to prune those trees in, in the summer anyway because it could attract bark beetles. That injury that you cause by pruning, it can, uh, it can release volatile chemicals that bark beetles can. So not only is it good for that, but also for the pitch moth, uh, so try to wait till winter or fall months to prune uh, pines. Insecticide sprays can reduce damage on landscape trees. You know, not really a big deal. This is more of a secondary pest that really doesn't require any management. Um, except, you know, even in really infested trees, it's hard to manage. The only way to kill the larvae that I've ever heard of is taking a paper clip and poking around in that, that gummy spot. And that, that's just, you know, and who knows if you, if you get the, if you've, you know, poked into or killed the caterpillar that's in there. It's really hard to see. Dwarf mistletoe, a very big one, okay? It's a small, leafless, parasitic plant. This plant only does about 1%. It only photosynthesizes about 1%. Um, it takes about 99% of its water and nutrients from the tree. Um, <clears throat> there's dwarf mistletoe in pinion and ponderosa. Mostly I see it in, in pinion in the urban or wild and urban environment. Um, so it's robbing the tree of nutrients and water on top of a drought. So not only do you have a drought, droughty conditions, you have this parasitic plant taking away even more um, from the tree. Urban pinion most infected. Slows growth, deforms tree, reduces seed production, causes dieback. Um, and kills, can kill trees under certain instances. And in, during a drought, so the, the drought, the dwarf mistletoe taking nutrients, these trees are going to be super stressed, so those trees are probably more primed to be attacked and killed by bark beetles. It predisposes them to attack. And I'll talk about how trees, how bark beetles know trees are being, are stressed uh, during the talk this afternoon. Control suppression strategies, prune infected branches. If you have like a lot of infection in that tree, you're just going to be pruning the whole canopy out of the tree. Um, if it's a light infestation, you notice one or two sprouts of Doris mistletoe, you can definitely prune. You want to go back about three, four, five inches because there's a root that runs in, uh, through the stem. So that root 
Even if you pull off or break off the sprouts, that root's going to send out shoots later on. Um, so pruning's good if it's a light infestation. Uh, plant other tree species that aren't susceptible. Um, so juniper, you know, whatever that's not a pine, that's not a pinion, if it's pinion mistletoe, dwarf mistletoe, or if it's ponderosa dwarf mistletoe. And there's this thing called florel. It's a, um, it's a plant growth re regulator that causes abscission. Um, so if you spray it on the, uh, the dwarf mistletoe sprouts instead of breaking it off, if you spray florel on there, they'll naturally fall off and you have about a two year or three year window where that is being controlled. The root's still in there and it will eventually sprout back up, but you get more control which might slow the spread of the dwarf mistletoe over time because when it's in an area, you know, it's, it, it's shoot out with water pressure. Water pressure builds up, shoots the seeds out at 55 miles per hour, thereabout, and it sticks to the tree, neighboring trees. So that's how it spreads on its own. So it's just kind of a slow spread throughout a, you know, PJ forest. Um, Elimination strategy. Um, so the Mescalero Apache tribe have this in their ponderosa pine. <clears throat> they clear cut their whole ponderosa pine stands where it was heavy and replanted, and they have no more dwarf mistletoe. It's an extreme thing to do. You might want to consider it, you might not, but just remember you can clear cut all your pinion, plant new pinion, but it's really hard to plant trees now. Carol Beta with New Mexico State Forestry says the best time to plant a tree was 30 years ago. So, you know, something to consider, um, but definitely that's, the, uh, that's the really the only way to control dwarf mistletoe is just to, to cut the trees down and just start over. This is what the sprouts look like. This is pretty heavily infestation. You know, we're talking about pr pruning. A lot of times it's in the main bowl of the tree, so you're just going to be, you know, cutting the tree half, you know, at the bowl, halfway up the bowl, and that's just not going to do anything good for your tree. European elm scale, see this a lot in their environment. You can see that dark color on the tree there. That's sooty mold. So these scales, they secrete sugar water. That sugar water gets on cars, um, chairs, you know, whatever's outside, it gets sticky. But after a time, sooty mold grows on it. So you can, during the middle of the winter, you can really pick out all the, you know, the Siberian elms that have, that have a European elm scale infestation because you see this sooty mold growing on the top of these branches. Um, they feed on the sap, um, small branches and leaves, causes leaf yellowing, premature leaf drop, um, severe infestations may kill the tree. Uh, honeydew production leads to sooty mold on leaves, branches, vehicles, outdoor furniture, etc. Management options, uh, just manage the tree to improve or maintain its health, whether that's watering, whether that's a little bit of um, fertilizer. Uh, monitor the scale populations on host plants if you want to, if that's concerning, concerning to your clients, whatnot. Um, apply a contact insecticide to coincide with scale crawler activity. So this is kind of like pinion needle scale. You want to monitor the activity of the crawlers. Apply the insecticide then. Um, Apply a systemic neonicotinoid, so emit a cloprid in the spring after leaves has expanded. So this is, you know, where you can inject it right in the tree, not, not off-target effects or very minimal off-target effects or a soil drench or something. And that's, that's going to help, you know, get them up, get that, um, if it translocates properly and in time, up to where that uh, systemic insecticide needs to be. Douglas fir tussock moth, not one I really talk about much during an urban forestry meeting. Um, however, uh, last year there was a, there's an infestation in public spaces all over Santa Fe. This is defoliation of blue spruce at the Santa Fe Rose Garden. Um, the hosts are dug fir, white fir, and spruce. So even though it does say Douglas fir tussock moth, it does infest other trees as well. Um, as you can see, it's a blue spruce right there. Feeding can cause severe to complete defoliation. Um, by the end of summer, this tree looks pretty bad. It, it got more defoliated, and um, it may get defoliated again this coming year, and there may no, be no hope for that, um, that, that tree if it gets fed on again this year. Uh, older caterpillars feed on all age classes of needles. So the younger, the, the younger caterpillars, they feed, they, 
they hatch from their eggs, it, it coincides with bud bursts. So when the bird buds are bursting from the tree, the caterpillar's hatching, they feed on those new, newly formed little buds that are breaking open. As the, mature, as the larvae matures or the caterpillar matures, it, feeds, it can feed on all age classes. So you can kind of see it's moving up in the apex of the tree, it's moving inward a little bit as those, um, those caterpillars are growing in size. So it can not only defoliate the outer part of the tree, but the inner part of the tree as well. Outbreak events can cause complete mortality in as little as one to two years. They just go in there and they're just defoliating that tree and that tree just gets stressed out and may not be able to, um, to, to survive that, that complete defoliation or that almost complete defoliation over one to two years. Bark beetle outbreaks can occur after Douglas fir tussock moth defoliation and this is more for like the wildland environment. Um, you know, I'm not so worried about this tree getting a, a, attacked by a Douglas fir be or um, spruce beetle because it's down in a, the Rose Park in Santa Fe, um, but out in the wildland um, environment, there can be outbreaks of uh, Douglas fir beetle, whatever, whatever species it is, Douglas, it may get attacked by bark beetles and then finished off. Management options, there's this thing called Bacillus thuringiensis kirstaki. This is a bacterium that um, only targets Lepidoptera, so moth and caterpillar larvae, okay? Very good, I think um, Monterey BT is one. Um, so this, this is an option um, to treat your trees. Uh, I talked with a couple of owners of tree companies in Santa Fe and they said that they've had some clients that's had this um, last year. Um, so it's not only in urban parks, but it is on people's property. Um, so this may be something that you want to be interested in. It's, you know, all it affects is that BT, Bacillus thuringiensis, is found in the soil and found on leaves naturally. So you're just using something that's in the environment anyway and you're spraying it. Carbaryl, or trade name 7, can be used um, during the outbreak. And there's this virus called NPV that builds up in the wildland environment when we're having outbreaks like this. It's a virus that attacks these Lepidoptera, or these uh, Douglas fir tussock moth, um, and so it can build up in the population and, and completely cause a collapse of the outbreak just with this virus. I don't think it really does anything in the urban environment just because maybe the populations, the, the caterpillar populations aren't high or maybe there's not enough of the virus coming into those, those loca isolated locations. Um, and predators like birds. Um, I noticed this tree I monitored a lot. I noticed a lot of bird activity in and around this tree. So the larva, um, as you saw on the, the intro slide, the cocoon, bottom left, the egg case, there's hundreds of eggs in that eggs case, frass, so you can dig around at the base of that tree and you can see these little, this little frass, so frass is insect poop, so this is insect poop from caterpillars, you can see down there on the top right, and then this year we had a huge outbreak pretty big outbreak of Douglas fir tussock moth um, on the Cibola National Forest. Um, Cibola National Forest in south of Tejeres. And uh, this is what it looks like in a, in a recreation area, complete defoliation of those trees there on the right. Uh, and those are primarily white fir, actually. Western tent caterpillar and fall webworm. This is kind of a big one when you're talking to homeowners about this. Um, this is a secondary pest. You know, it's just causing aesthetic damage. It's not going to kill the tree. Um, maybe you have some, a couple of tents on your tree one year and it's not there the next. Some people just, you know, prune the, prune the, the branch off or the twig off wherever this is. I don't recommend that. You can, once you prune, some pathogens can get in the pruning cut. You know, either pull off the tent and the caterpillars with your hand with some gloves on. Um, you know, bag it up, throw it away. You can spray it with uh, BT, um, you know, some, some other insecticides, but really just, you know, let it be. Uh, that's what I usually tell people unless they're really, you know, up in arms about it. And then I'm saying, you know, just pull the tents off if you want to. Um, so that's what I recommend. Tent caterpillar, tents confined to branches, um, to cr branch crotches, so that's how you can tell a difference in the two. One, diff one way you can tell a difference between the two tighter, more dense webs, so kind of matted a little bit more. 
And the, the main way you can tell the difference is because tent caterpillars are active in the spring. Um, spring, early summer, fall webworms active in the fall, okay, or late summer. And the, the tent covers the branch ends with fall webworm. They're less dense tents. You can kind of see through them more. Um, so that's ways you can definitely tell the difference between the two. But regardless, treatment's kind of the same. Future pest threats. Um, so EAB, it's, in, it's around the Denver area. It's in East Texas. It's probably just a matter of time. I have heard velvet, or uh, sorry, Arizona ash may be a little bit more resistant um, to emerald ash borer. We'll see. Um, so this is an invasive species from Asia, not yet detected here in New Mexico. It may already be here. A lot of you guys are the frontline defense. So um, you know you look for those characteristic D-shaped exit holes. You're looking for dieback, like the image. You're looking for sp sprouting up in the canopy, unusual sprouting. Um, so that's kind of what you're looking for. Larvae feed on a phloem of ash trees. So this is a wood borer. Part of its life cycle, it spins right under the bark, feeding on the phloem. Another part of its life cycle, it's inside the wood pupating. Okay. Um, eventually girdles and kills the tree when it's being mass attacked by emerald ash borer. Hundreds of millions of ash trees have been killed in the U.S. in those characteristic D-shaped exit holes. Prevention strategies, imidacloprid is, is the big one. That's what they're protecting all these trees with is imidacloprid, systemic injections. And plant other species than ash. I mean, um, we should be planning now for the eventual um, invasion of emerald ash borer into the state. Spotted lanternfly, will it get here? Will it survive in our desert climate? Uh, yet to be seen, we don't know. Uh, aggressive invasive species from Asia, again, a sap-sucking insect, so it's feeding on the juices of the tree. Um, feeds on hardwoods, so tree of heaven, which would be nice, right? If we could get rid of some tree of heaven, right? Willow, sycamore, maple, and poplar, so maybe we want it here, I don't know. Um, egg masses can be spread long distance via human transport. They can lay eggs on the side of a car, side of a recreation vehicle. So that's kind of how it spreads around, spreads around quickly. Signs and symptoms. Um, so a sign is the insect itself or like boring dust, something that the insect is doing. It's exuvi, so it's leftover exoskeleton from molting or, or pupating or whatnot. Um, a symptom is what the tree is doing itself. So tree oozing sap is a symptom of the, of the infestation. Honeydew, you know, being or sooty mold under the tree. Um, so those are some signs, not to mention the conspicuous insect itself. Um, and as we've probably heard in the news, you know, they're paying people to go out and um, squish these insect sex. Um, control prevention strategies, search for, remove, kill egg masses and or the nymphs and adults. You can see them, they're pretty conspicuous. And systemic insecticides, again, the imidacloprid, um, systemically, you know, soil drench or, or, or direct injection into the tree. And Mediterranean pine engraver. This is a pretty new one. Um, from the Mediterranean region, first detected in California. Um, it is now in Phoenix and Tucson. We are surveying it here in the state, for it here in the state. We have not found it yet. But if it's in Tucson, it may just be a matter of time coming down I-10. Um, Afghan, so this is more for the southern part of the state, for those of you in the southern part of the state. So the Mediterranean pines, Alep Afghan uh, in Aleppo. <clears throat> Signs and symptoms uh, there on the, on the left of that image, the uh, kind of fading or dying of the tree up top uh, in that Afghan pine. Boring dust, just like with any other bark beetle species, um, and galleries under bark. And they kind of look have that characteristic look there. You can find better pictures of that what that gallery looks like online. Um, so that's just what to look out for. Control, control prevention strategies, properly water high value Mediterranean pines. Easier said than done, um, but those that are high value, you know, they, the homeowner, the client, whatever, should be watering those trees as much as they can. Contact insecticides, carbaryl or permethrin, those are two contact insecticides that are um, registered for bark beetles, um, and it works with Mediterranean pine engraver as well. 
And again, you want to apply it before they emerge, which is probably around, um, we don't really know yet here in the southwest, but probably, you know, you want to apply the contact insecticide around February or March. Just an example of how not to prune a tree. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Um, I did have a couple of questions. So, it's theoretically, to my thinking, the egg mass removal for the needle scale could be effective. In your experience, why has it not been? So, he's asking about the pinion needle scale egg masses and why I think, uh, or <coughs> what's been my experience with removing those. Um, you know, one of the HOAs bought a huge water sprayer, and they just went around to every tree and treated those things and tried to remove every little bit they can. But it's just like, you know, some of those crawlers get knocked off from the, the webbing itself. Um, you know, I just think it's hard to gather up all that material 100% to where there's no crawlers. Because if, even if you have a little crawlers left, they're going to infest that tree. And um, it's just... And it's labor intensive as well. Um, that's another thing. So it's just how much do you want to try? I think maybe if you did that water treatment and try to remove as much as you can over two or three or four years, you'll start seeing an impact. But it's not going to be a, it's not definitely not a one year type of treatment. You know, just do it one year and it, that'll work. No, it's going to be two or three or four years. So he's asking about using Florel for the control of mistletoe, uh, the timing that you'd want to do that. Um, I think probably any other time other than winter time would be the best, and probably spring would be, uh, spring, early summer would be the best for that. Uh, and it may be on the label. You may be able to le read the label. Yes? Um, I, I'm an entomological nerd, as it were, uh, in a sea of all the tree nerds, so thanks for having me here, guys. Um, <laughs> But uh, for, for those who don't know the other members of Lepidoptera, you had mentioned that BT is only effective against the Lepidopterans. I know what the rest of that grouping is, but I, I think it's probably best if we just mention, hey, butterflies too. Sure. Yep. Um, and, and other strong pollinators are impacted by BT. Um, so make sure you read your labels and strongly consider drift, uh, yes. especially with some of our bigger trees like in Corallus and, and the like. Um, that's one of the concerns with BT. Um, uh, yes, it can, you know, it can impact your, you know, just your butterflies out there, any other moths that you, any other caterpillars, butterflies and moths that you're not, that you don't want to target can, that BT can contact them if there's drift and it can kill them. So there are some off target effects from using BT or BTK. Yes. For the one pine moth that had all the hairs on it, do we have to worry about allergies for skins like we do for the oak caterpillar over in Europe? Um, so for the, so which caterpillar are you referring to? The, the one? tusset moth, the one yes. that has all the hairs on it. And Thanks. especially getting yes. in the urban, if we're going hiking, I yes. know uh, <laughs> if we're in that area, are we gonna break out in hives or in all those fun things? Yes, thank you so much for that question. So Douglas fir tussock moth has urticating hairs. Urticating means stinging. They can cause, those hairs can cause a rash if they get on your skin. They, if the outbreak's big enough, those um, hairs can become airborne and get into your lungs and cause anaphylaxis in some people um, or just irritation for others. So it's called tussockosis is the medical term. So, so be, be aware, in that tree that I showed you at, at the Rose Park in Santa Fe, there was people underneath that tree just hanging out because it was shade in the middle of summer. And there's, you know, she was like, oh yeah, I knocked one off my leg earlier and there's one dangling over her head. So I was like, you may want to move uh, unless you want a, ra uh, a rash. So, yes. Um, for the European uh, elm scale, why, why would dormant spray not uh, suffocate them? It, it because they are not a um, they're not an armored scale, so it probably would work. I might not have put that on there for treatment options, but 
As long as it's on the label, treatment for soft scale, then it should work. Yes. Okay, thank yeah. you. Mm -hmm. You had mentioned that the, uh, the western tent caterpillar was a secondary insect. I, we were in southwest Colorado, and last year we had a huge outbreak of uh, western tent caterpillar in our aspen trees. Mm -hmm. Hundreds of acres were affected. Um, so if this is a continued issue, would that can be considered still a secondary insect or primary? That's a good uh, point, and you're from New Mexico? Um, from New Mexico, we have Col I'm in Colorado. Southwest Colorado. So there's been a big outbreak right above Santa Fe in the uh, Aspen Vista area. It's been going on for five or six years now. Completely defoliating the trees up there, 100% defoliation. The thing about hardwoods is, especially those hardwoods that would be defoliating early in the spring, forest, uh, western tent caterpillar is this, remember the difference between fall webworm and uh, western tent caterpillar. Western tent caterpillar is in the spring. It defoliates all those trees, but the tree, by the time that the caterpillar's pupating and whatnot, those trees are refoliating. They refoliate with smaller, um, smaller leaves, and you may notice above Santa Fe, the, the fall color of the aspens is gone. The, col the color of those refoliated leaves is dull. It's not really yellow anymore. And the thing about aspen is it can refoliate. It can photosynthesize for the rest of the year. It can store a lot of amount of its energy and its nutrients and water in the roots, and it's very clonal. So it, it takes, um, even though it is an outbreak, and I would say in that case it is a primary pest because it very is stressing out the trees a lot. However, aspen are kind of set up for that that kind of thing. More in the urban, I was talking about more in the urban environment. We kind of see it as a secondary pest. I, you know, sometimes I'll see trees with five or six tents on it, but you're not going to, you know. And rarely do you ever see complete defoliation in the urban environment from western tent caterpillar. Uh, and also another thing with aspen, it's one of the only tree species that photosynthesizes during the winter. It photosynthesizes during its, through its bark. So even though it doesn't have leaves anymore, it can photosynthesize through its bark. Um, so that helps it as well. Yes, Marissa. Yeah, thanks. So I have a question from online um, about cypress bark beetle, specifically yeah. in Grant County, and um, do you have strategies for control? Yes, uh, so cypress bark beetles um, attack juniper. Um, well, there's cypress, there's cedar bark beetles, cypress bark beetles kind of, they kind of have the same behavior between the two. Um, and they're not as aggressive as the ones that attack pines. Uh, same, same treatment. Prevention would be the same. Water your trees. Um, you know, maybe give them a little bit of shot of fertilizer, maybe. Um, and you use those contact insecticides. That's really the big three there. So that's, that's what I have to say about you know, any kind of bark beetles, really. But the, the cedar bark beetles or cypress bark beetles, they're less aggressive. Um, they can get a little bit more aggressive if the trees are really stressed out, but generally you see it in low levels around the state. <clears throat> Thank you. And, and, yeah. I have some more questions, but go ahead, Hunter. Okay. Well, you had pointed out multiple times that um, uh, one of the best preventions for things is to water trees that are stressed, but I think uh, one of the other elements that uh, maybe gets overlooked often is the heat stress. And uh, too many people are planting trees with gravel underneath them, um, using organic uh, wood mulch or something else beneath it. But I think I see a lot of trees stressed because they're planted in a big gravel bed. Yes, sir. Very good point. Um, I'm going to talk about that in my, uh, this afternoon in my other one, the drought and bark beetles. I'm going to mention heat and mention the issues we have with heat on trees. So not only are we in drought period, but our summers are getting warmer, our winters are getting warmer, and uh, drought combined with heat is, uh, is, is stressing the trees out even more. Okay, another question. This is from Amos, who's uh, zoomed in. Is spotted lanternfly a primary or secondary pest? I've heard it can cause tree mortality, um, you know, and it, it builds up its numbers rapidly. It mass attacks trees. Um, so I would say, both um, <laughs> depends. Yes, <laughs> it can be both, um, and it depends. I don't really have any, you know, real-world experience with it yet. Just what I've heard and read, um, but I think it could be both secondary. You know, causing some leaf drop, some uh, chlorosis, some, um, you know, this and that. So, 
So, so both is my answer. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Um, yesterday we learned about this tremendous effort to track you know, emerald ash borer um, from the Dana and Dana presentation, and I'm wondering if you're aware of any ongoing efforts to tr track these other ones or emerging new you know, species that might be worrisome to that level down the road, or um, maybe for different ecotypes, is there some, are they all individual efforts? Is there, are you aware of resources for kind of tracking all of these or anything like that? There are, so um, <clears throat> not only with the U.S. Forest Service do we, mo we're monitoring or trying to monitor Mediterranean pine and graver populations. Um, so that's kind of what we're focusing on right now. Uh, USDA APHIS, um, they, in, in New, Mar New, New Mexico Department of e uh, Agriculture, they kind of do the uh, emerald ash borer monitoring um, together. Um, and uh, to your point, last year we did an early detection rapid response survey. Or was that two years ago, Victor? Two years ago. Um, we did an er early detection rapid response um, survey for native or invasive bark and ambrosia beetles. So we had traps in El Paso, we had traps in Las Cruces, we had traps in um, Belen, or Belen um, Albuquerque, and Santa Fe. So we, we put that up to see if we have any new bark or ambrosia beetles in the state. We didn't find any new records of stuff. So yes, every year we're doing something new to, to try to keep track of those things. Um, <clears throat> Arizona Department of Fi Forestry and Fire Management, they're monitoring po Mediterranean pine and graver, and they have a website you can go to to see where they've called them. So you can kind of see maybe as it moves through Tucson and maybe gets more to New Mexico, they can probably show you that on there. Once we get it here, we'll probably do a similar thing with the map and where we've detected things. Okay, a question from Jose. Uh, do you have a favorite or a recommended resource for pest online, like what's, what's your go-to? Yeah, um, so for conifer pests in particular, there's a publication by Bob Kane and um, another gentleman I can't remember right now, but it's called Conifer Pests of New Mexico. Very good, very good resource for conifer pests. Um, and to go a step bigger, there's a field guide to insects and diseases in New Mexico and Arizona. That's also online. Both of those, and that one is, is much thicker, um, hardwoods and conifers. So that one's called Field Guide to insects and diseases of New Mexico and Arizona, forest insects and diseases in New Mexico and Arizona. So those are the two that I recommend that are specific to the Southwest or, or New Mexico. Yeah. Thank you. And many of you will remember last year, um, Ann Aubrey spoke about this uh, collective ep effort in Arizona and New Mexico, and John's involved with that. And so that is going to be coming online. I'm not sure when, but um, we'll announce it when it does. Yes. I was wondering if you could touch briefly on mistletoe on juniper. Is it the same as what we're seeing on pinion? No. Mistletoe on juniper is a true mistletoe or a leafy mistletoe, kind of the mistletoe that for Christmas, you know, um, that you see in hardwoods. Um, it's, it looks a little bit differently than the, the lif mis leafy mistletoe on hardwoods, the one that's on juniper. It's not a, it's not a full parasite. It's a hemiparasite. It's a half parasite, meaning it takes about half its water and nutrients from junipers, not as um, detrimental to the health of the tree. However, I've seen some junipers that have more mistletoe in them than actual needles. So, you know, it, it can, and it causes a lot of dieback. So it can get to a point where that juniper mistletoe is just overwhelming the tree so much that it's causing the tree to decline. Another thing about that mistletoe on juniper, junipers are really good they're really drought tolerant species and they can shut their stoma off or their little pores on their needles. They can shut those off themselves, but the mistletoe keeps respirating. It keeps doing its thing. So even though the tree's like, oh, it's droughty and I need to shut my stoma down, those mistletoe that are in that tree are still respirating and still taking water and nutrients from that tree and, and, and putting it into the environment. So they can be detrimental, but it's not as detrimental as, as uh, it's dwarf mistletoe, and the juniper mistletoe is spread by birds. Birds eat the seeds, they go, you know, poop the seeds out somewhere, those seeds stick to a branch, and it grows from there. So you can kind of tell of a, a tree that 
birds really like to nest in or just stay in because there might be just overwhelming amounts of mistletoe, juniper mistletoe in it. Yes? Um, I see a lot of canker on prunus trees mm -hmm. in town. Uh, how would you recommend addressing that? Um, so canker, so you're going to, and it's probably caused by a, pa a fungal pathogen. Um, is that what you're finding? Or bacteria? Yeah, so it depends on what it is. Um, you know, just having a well-watered tree can just up, you know, the immunity or the resistance of that tree to that pathogen. Um, you got to be really be, if somebody's pruning the tree, you know, uh, sterilize that pruning equipment. If, if you notice the cankers and you're doing some pruning on that tree, you know, fungicides um, work pretty well with fungal, uh, cankers caused by fungal pathogens, bacteria, bactericides maybe. I haven't had much experience with bacteria caused cankers and pruna species, but um, so I'd have to look into that a little bit more and maybe, maybe Victor has something to add, but um, I don't know much about bacterial canker at least. Um, but I do know a well-watered, a, a very healthy tree can kind of fend off, you know, those, atta those, those uh, infections. We keep talking about Elmore ash borer, but there's another insect that's devastating our ash trees. Uh -huh. It's a bark beetle. Are you familiar with this insect? Um, bark beetle and ash. Um, Starts in the twigs, usually works down into the main branches, and then goes down to the trunk. Yeah, um, so yes. Um, and again, um, I wish I could remember the common name of it. Uh, but you see it here in the state? Uh, yes, I've seen evidence here in Albuquerque. I work in Farmington, mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. it's all over our city, and okay. I've been watching it for years. Yeah, and that's, that's probably another one that, uh, again, um, I can't remember the, the species of that bark beetle. Um, ash twig beetle? Yes, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, twig beetle, so those are responding... So dendroctinus, like mountain pine beetle, southwestern pine beetle, those are uh, attacking and killing apparently healthy trees. But the, the, the twig beetles and the ips, they're responding to some, some stressor. So, you know, whether it's restricted root zone, drought, heat, you know. Um, so if a tree's properly maintained, you probably see a lot less of that activity. And again, carbaryl or something like that <laughs> sprayed on the twigs would help. All right, thank but you. That's what I got for you. Thank you. All right, thanks so much. Another question from Linda online, and maybe you'll cover this more or, or, or more generally already did, but this is how about Western cedar borer mm -hmm. strategies? Yes. And, yeah, or this afternoon. Yes, so um, so there's juniper twig borer, a twig pruner. There's um, a borer, also a styloxis something, the juniper borer itself. I kind of like to get away from calling it cedar borer or cedar bark beetle because we don't have any true cedars um, here. You know, there's the cedars of Lebanon, there's true cedars in the Middle East and stuff like that. So, um, you know, even like where I come from, the Southeast, there's Eastern red cedar, which is not really a cedar. <laughs> so I kind of like to just refer to everything as juniper. Um, but, um, so when it comes to wood borers like that, they're responding to a stressed tree. They, they, normally, um, they normally don't attack a tree. They like a tree that's, that's um, its defenses are down, that's stressed, that can't defend itself. So that's what they're responding to is, is again, stress of some sort. Um, to protect a tree from wood borers, you can use a metacloprid, kind of like emerald ash borer. You can, you can do a systemic insecticide via soil drench or um, direct injections. Um, Carbaryl also works. Um, so again, it's just kind of more of the same with those, with those wood borers or those bark beetles or those ambrosia beetles. It's all kind of the same um, prevention strategy. Thank you. Mm -hmm. But they, they can be a nuisance. Um, the juniper borer did kill one of my own juniper trees in my house. It happens. Thank you.